West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Among the things we learned at today's hearing was about a new national embarrassment. How our Defense Department called a whole other country and showed our dirty laundry about just how far our own government under Donald Trump was willing to go to pursue even the most bonkers, bonkers, bonkers conspiracy theories. So the final email here included a completely baseless conspiracy theory that an Italian defense contractor uploaded software to a satellite that switched votes from Trump to Biden. The select committee investigation found that this wild, baseless conspiracy theory made it from the recesses of the internet to the highest echelons of our government. On December 31st, Mr. Meadows received this internet conspiracy theory from Representative Perry. On the screen now is the text that Representative Perry sent to Mr. Meadows, copying a YouTube link with the message, quote, why can't we just work with the Italian government? The next day, the president's chief of staff sent the YouTube link to Mr. Rosen, who forwarded it to Mr. Donahue. Mr. Donahue, did you watch this video? I did, Congressman. How long was the video? Approximately 20 minutes. Let's just take a look at a excerpt of that video, if we may. What's being said out of Rome, out of Italy, is that this was done in the U.S. Embassy. That there was a certain State Department guy whose name I don't know uh, yet. I guess this is probably going to come out in Italy at some point. And he was the mastermind, not the mastermind, but the, um, but the, anyway, the guy running the operation of changing the votes. And that he was doing this in conjunction with some support from MI6 the CIA, and this Leonardo group. Mr. Donahue, what was your reaction when you watched that entire 20-minute video? I emailed the acting attorney general, uh, and I said pure insanity, which was my impression of the video, which was patently absurd. Patently absurd. A patently absurd video about vote switching satellites and the Leonardos uh, made its way from Republican Congressman Scott Perry to White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, then to the highest levels of the U.S. Justice Department. We learned today that the White House Chief of Staff then didn't let it go. He wanted the Attorney General, Jeffrey Rosen, to meet personally with the man you saw speaking on the video. Mr. Rosen shut that down in no uncertain terms, but still the White House would not let the matter go. White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows later passed the matter on to the defense secretary. The ask for him was, can you call out the defense attache realm and find out what the heck's going on because I'm getting all these weird, crazy reports and probably the guy on the ground knows more than anything. The select, select committee confirmed that a call was actually placed by Secretary Miller to the attache in Italy to investigate the claim that Italian satellites were switching votes 
from Trump to Biden. This is one of the best examples of the lengths to which the pres President Trump would go to stay in power. Scouring the internet to support his conspiracy sh theories shown here, as he told Mr. Donahue in that December 27th call, quote, you guys may not be following the internet the way I do. The other revelation about this today, and it's just astonishing, um, is that the guy who th was promoting this was working with Rudy Giuliani. Right. Of course. And they were very offended that they didn't work, that that didn't mean that they could stovepipe their concerns right to the attorney general. You know, they say the internet is undefeated <laughs> and shout out to the internet. There's all kinds of interesting <laughs> stuff on there. Yeah. This is bananas. It's embarrassing. That's the insane part to quote him. Yeah. The serious part is it's still pressure on the Pentagon to get involved in discrediting the election. And, and that's it still gets wrong. the Secretary of Defense to call another country and be like, hi, we're looking into this. <laughs> and I'm that the other Secretary country, of Defense of America. And that other country is like, sweet. Berlusconi <laughs> looks totally normal now. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, you they know, love you getting the call. may not be following the internet the way I do. That might be the problem. You Isn't have to follow amazing? the internet in order to know the what's The President on. of the United States believing that the Department of Justice, the government that works for him, they, they don't follow the internet. They like don't follow the internet like he does. The amazing thing here, though, is that what we get is some form of accountability. Honestly, the reason that you do a congressional investigation is in part so that we can talk about it right now, so that the public knows that this happens, that the lengths to which they went included having the defense secretary follow up on the crazy Italian satellite YouTube video that somebody texted to the White House chief of staff a quarter before midnight on New Year's Eve. Was there alcohol involved? I don't know, <laughs> but I kind of hope so, because otherwise that's a worse explanation. Us knowing this is part of the accountability in fact, that we're looking for. Be because I think the thing we'll be talking about long after these are done and the things that may justify a deeper dive is how deep down into the government his lies and his, you know, Bill Barr would say his BS spun those agencies around from what were core missions. It had nothing to do with defending the United States of America here or around the world to be picking up the phone and saying, you know, hey, um, you know, do you have a translator around? I have to ask you about this thing on YouTube. You know, neither did it justify anyone's time or energy to have DOJ. It sounds like they ran down everything short of that one. And yeah. by the way, you know, when he didn't call the Department of Defense, when the Capitol was being ransacked. That's exactly right. Right. It is Friday, the 24th of June of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Well, how are you on this fabulous last day of the week before we go into the weekend? And who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, we, we all wish that we could have our weekends back because of how it was during the Trump years. Every weekend there was something else. Oh my God, they put babies in icebox baby gulags. Oh my God, they're separating kids and adopting them out. These weird crystal fascist adoption agencies run by the DeVosses. Now... <laughs> somehow somehow it's like that and it's with the same actors too wow man I would hope that Hugo Chavez would you know I don't know appear and punch JFK Jr. out so we can get it over with oh my god well uh, the what I call the gun nut troll bots descended like locusts upon my timeline <laughs> because I dared I dared speak ill of the SCOTUS decision allowing just anybody to conceal a gun now. Apparently I want only criminals to have guns and innocent people can't defend themselves. What? <laughs> you can defend yourself. Run! <laughs> I can't run. What about women and disabled people? They need guns too. Everybody needs guns. Wow. And so I just mentioned, you know, it really sounds like you want to kill people, doesn't it? Yeah, they're all a bunch of Bernard Getzes. They all think that there's like crime is just like so bad everywhere in the world. Well, at least in their world, wherever that is. I don't know. Among the wheat. 
Actually, I think there is a lot of crime among the weed. I was reading statistics, and in communities where there's a lot of white people, there's more crime. I'm, I'm serious. That's the study. So, I don't know. Check out the demographics for neighborhoods you want to move into. The more white people, the more crime. Violent crime, too, by the way. You want got to stay away from them. They don't know how to, I don't know. They can't handle their emotions, I guess. All right. Well, I know I shouldn't be making it a race issue, but I really think these Bernard Getzes, when they dream at night and they're defending themselves and I don't know everybody else on the subway, it's not a bunch of white kids coming to you know harass them. All right. Let's just put it that way. The only reason I got all these weird gun nuts in my timeline accusing me of wanting only criminals to have guns is because they 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 have I well this is how I like to put it their view of the world is colored mhm to harken back to a nomenclature from days gone by and that's what they're reacting to they see a world where their little small-minded idea of how the world is is being impinged upon by reality. And what is that reality? Well, it ain't among the wheat. Not just the wheat. So, uh, you know, there's corn too, you know. But no one talks about the okra. It's always forgotten. Always. Or the butter bean. You can't have succotash without a butter bean. It's the rules of the road. So, uh, yeah, I was attacked by the minions of a particular, I don't know, gun party politico type who said that he came in, I don't know, in the bronze medal position for president. I don't know. It's a it's a gun pro gun party. I guess uh, I finally went to the guy's uh, profile and uh, uh, apparently he wants people to get out of the uh, GOP and the NRA and join his party. <laughs> I noticed that there were no Democrats involved in it. No, no. So, yes, yes. Um, it had a particular s- smell, a whiff a Vlad among the uh, the troll bots. A little too coordinated, shall we say. Very similar to how it was when Maria Botina was here. Ah, yeah, I just got to say, is she working again? I know that she's a politico over there and stuff and a hero. But I don't know, is she working again? All right, well, I am not advocating for a Charles Bronson movie society. And that's what these people think. You know, I mean, the Charles Bronson movies did arise out of Bernard Getz or did, I don't know which came first chicken and egg. And I like Charles Bronson as an actor, tough guy. (sighs) But I don't know. I just didn't like the uh, racial overtones of the death wish movies. All right. Oh, they're going to home invasion. They're going to, like, rape my wife and kill my daughter and my dog. And now i got to go out and exact revenge. Well, that's good. It's in the movies. It's not real life. Yeah, I know that there's some Nazi meth heads out there. and I, <laughs> Oh, you just want them to have guns. We don't want us to defend ourselves. And in the same breath, these people were saying that we can't rely on the cops. Well, yeah. (laughs) But the solution is not to make this the Wild West. And who are the innocent people involved? I would think the innocent people would be the innocent bystanders getting shot up by these warring factions. Innocent people have to defend themselves. Yeah, that's why we want to make sure there's some gun regs so a bunch of paranoids are not roaming the streets looking for an excuse to kill somebody. And they always say, oh, no, I don't want to kill anybody, but I will if I have to. Sounds like you're really looking to the point where you really have to then. 
which means you want to. I don't want to kill anybody, so I don't go looking for it. <sighs> I know. Terrible things can befall a family. My best friend back in the 60s, a guy who got uh, released from a Texas jail over and over and over, uh, beat the crap out of uh, John's mom and John's brothers at the time. One was like, I, I think, junior high and the other and Ken was like, I think, a freshman maybe in high school. Gangly, tall kid, you know, but not very much meat on him. Eric was pretty tough, but he was the only in junior high. <sighs> and uh, my best friend's dad was an LAPD homicide detective. He rushed home. This was before the, uh, the uh, 55 freeway was built. The Pomona freeway was built. It wasn't even excavated then. So... Uh, yeah, these things happen, and terrible things can befall a family. But I do remember the kind of... Oh, I shouldn't... Maybe, should I say their name? I remember that my best friend's family didn't amass an arsenal of weaponry to protect themselves the next time that was going to happen. I like to take the world according to Garp point of view. You know, when he and his wife were house hunting, and they come upon a house, and as they're meeting up with the... Uh, with the uh, real estate agent to tour the home, a small plane crashes into the roof. And then Garp, you know, Robin Williams comes out and says, Honey, honey, we have to get the house. It's been disaster proofed. What is the possibility of, uh, of another plane crashing in the roof? I mean, it's already happened, right? So that's my, that's my viewpoint on life, you know? Every time you jump into the ocean doesn't mean you're going to drown every time. Oh, I can't take a bath because I, I almost drowned. Well, you know, you, I, I, I just don't think that's a healthy psychology. I mean, people can deal with it the way they can deal. But I don't like the idea of people incapable of dealing with it carrying a gun. Because, yeah... What about the innocent people, the innocent bystander? Why do we have to be caught up in a shootout among warring factions? Maybe we don't want the nukes. Okay. All right. Well, that was, uh, yeah, a little far flung maybe, but we do have the curated show for you as we end this fabulous week. And I cannot wait. And, you know, July is only around the corner, so these hearings are going to be up and going real soon. So stay tuned for that. Boy. Anyway, uh, we did start off with uh, the Trump Secretary of Defense, Christopher Miller, back in the day. He had to call Italy to debunk the ridiculous Italy gate conspiracy theory. Uh, what the hell? <laughs> and, they, and they act like this is all normal. Trump's defense is going to be, and and I heard the uh, the uh, documentarian that came in that uh, the the other one, not not the one that was following the January sixth insurrection, but one who sat down with the Trumps and interviewed each of them and whatnot. Uh, one of the principals, director, or somebody involved, producer, director said that he doubted very much that Trump actually believed that he won and this was all you know a big scam and all of that. And then after sitting down and speaking with him and dealing with them in the midst of uh, producing this documentary, uh, he came to believe that Trump truly does believe that he won. Well, there's a lot of people who truly believe the world is flat, but it's not true. And are we supposed to just go ahead and say, oh, yeah, well, we're going to change the rest of our world so that it fits your view of a flat earth? No, that's not how it works. This guy doesn't get the force of the Department of Justice to go after flat earth theories. 
please. Man, I don't know. He's white and entitled and has happened his whole life, so I guess he expects it. On the rest of the menu here as we begin this fabulous Blue Moon Spirits Fridays in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Because save room, there's still a chef's table for the amuse-bouche. The education department will erase about $6 billion of student loan debt for defrauded borrowers. Good. Proposed in the wake of the Pandora Papers, a bipartisan House panel approved expanding anti-money laundering reporting requirements, and you just know Ted Cruz and Rubio and all the others are going to be against it. And the Virginia Board of Health reprimanded reprimanded that state health commissioner that we had reported on earlier for those scandalous remarks dismissing scientific evidence of structural racism in health outcomes. After the break, we move to the chef's table where a U.S. woman who was denied an emergency abortion to save her life while vacationing in Malta has been airlifted out amid those fears for her life. And the new Australian leader is set to visit France to fix their damaged relations. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. With the Supreme Court find, finding no compunction to uh, and overturning a 100-year-plus statute from New York about being able to carry a gun anywhere on the streets, they would find no problem overturning Roe v. Wade, which is exactly what they've done. All right. Well, you know, packing the courts... And uh, back in the courts when the opposition president is in power. Wow, that was a Hail Mary that worked, huh? Still working. Okay. If you would uh, go to our homepage at netroosradio.com and near the bottom of our homepage at the right of the page is the chat room link. The chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of the chat room link across the page there at our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, uh, it helps us pay our bills and fly under the radar and continue this powerhouse of resistance against, you know, the pack courts, against this hostile takeover of democracy. Not just here in America, but around the world, indeed. If you could afford an espresso-type coffee drink and send those funds our way, we are able to stretch those dollars and pay those bills I just mentioned and continue this powerhouse of resistance. And we thank those of you who have been so generous in allowing us to fulfill our civic duty, as the founders originally intended so many years ago. Follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Thank you, Tom, for taking care of that. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. Get that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. And the show notes and links are, of course, where the real reportage is. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. And the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library can be found at the Internet Archive at archive.org. All right. Of course, I didn't open up this tab, so I might as well do it right at this moment because this first offering here 
in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes out of the Washington Post by Deb or Lauren Lumpkin. The education department will erase about $6 billion of student loan debt for borrowers who argued in a class action lawsuit the agency ignored their claims for loan cancellation under the proposed settlement. The department will immediately approve thousands of applications filed by people who claim they were defrauded by their colleges, resolving a three-year-old case between the government and borrowers. In a statement... Education Secretary Miguel Cardona said the Biden administration has worked to address issues regarding the borrower defense to repayment process designed to provide federal loan forgiveness to students whose colleges lie to them to get them to enroll. The agreement between the department and borrowers will provide automatic relief including refunds of amounts paid to the federal agency and credit repair, according to the Project on Predatory Student Lending, a legal organization that represents former college students. It will affect 200,000 people who attended schools, the department says, engaged in misconduct. Another group of about 64,000 borrowers who took out loans to attend schools that are not on the department's list of disgraced schools will get decisions on their borrower defense applications on rolling deadlines, the legal organization said in a release. Will Fitzgibbon of the Washington Post brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. A bipartisan group of lawmakers cleared a major hurdle this week to advance what they call the most significant revision to America's anti-money laundering laws in 20 years. The bill called the Enablers Act, amends the 52-year-old Bank Secrecy Act to require for the first time that trust companies, lawyers, art dealers, and others investigate clients seeking to move money and assets into the American financial system. Those covered by the law, who include financial advisors and Art and antiquities traders would also be required to report suspicious activity to the Treasury Department. Real estate transactions would not be covered by the law, however, because that's where the most money laundering happens. What the hell? Banks are already required to vet their clients and their sources of of wealth, but other American financial gatekeepers have been exempted from due diligence rules, a loophole long criticized by financial crime experts and international watchdogs. Portnoy, also of the Washington Post, brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. 
Virginia Board of Health members on Thursday yesterday told Health Commissioner Colin Green that his comments dismissing evidence of structural racism in health outcomes and calling gun violence a political talking point damaged the health department, its employees, and marginalized communities. After questioning Green for nearly an hour, the board passed a resolution expressing members' embarrassment over his views and advised him not to publicly question basic scientific facts regarding disparities. The reprimand came just over a week after Green's answers to questions about a tense meeting with his employees who work with vulnerable mothers and infants were published by the Washington Post. Comments that elicited raw feedback from black lawmakers and a pointed statement from Governor Yunkin, who this week told reporters he had not yet decided whether to fire Green. Well, well, well. It is now time to go to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world and we will finish up these stories that we've curated for you today, which makes the story out of Malta even more poignant considering the fact that the stacked SCOTUS have ruled the way they have. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, dinosaurs are back on fast food ads. Four years after the disaster on Dino Island, Universal is back with the $185 million Jurassic World Dominion. Dinosaurs now roam the Earth and interact with humans, but for the formula here to keep working, there has to be some physical entity where well-intentioned but ultimately corrupt things transpire. In this one, that's the Biosyn Corporation, located in the Dolomite Mountains of Italy, which is under the tutelage of the aggressive, unethical, and recognizable Dr. Dodgson, who's still dedicated to the lofty ideals of genetic tinkering to benefit mankind, because that's worked out so well before. The suspicion here is that Biosyn has resurrected some prehistoric locusts, which don't eat Biosyn crops, but do eat everything else, shout out Monsanto, and which threaten the world's food supply. With evil afoot, especially Biosyn's interest in Owen Grady's secret clone daughter and pet velociraptor, the action is set. A lot of what follows is now termed fan service. While there's a lack of suspense in the usual sense here, there is some suspense or at least interest in how the various characters from the 30-year arc of the franchise will interact in the face of new challenges. I mean, what fan doesn't want to see what an aging Jeff Goldblum's character is up to, if Owen and Claire are getting on any better, or how Maisie is growing up? There's a wonderful chase scene through Malta, and the dinosaurs look better than ever, but leaps in technology don't make up for leaps in the plot, or the huh-what 10-second solution to that whole world food supply issue thing. Jurassic World Dominion is what it is, and because of so many people like me who've seen the other movies, it's turned that 185 mil into over 500 at press time. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. Have you ever wondered what the world looks like from the eyes of animals? An Immense World, written and read by Pulitzer Prize-winning science journalist Ed Young, takes us on a fascinating journey that will transform the way you see the world. Through every animal's unique sensory bubble, we learn what bees see in flowers, what songbirds hear in their tunes, and what dogs smell on the street. An Immense World is steeped with science, but suffused with magic. An Immense World by Ed Young is available everywhere audiobooks are sold. Why would a normally developing girl stop walking? What causes a middle-aged person to lose their sense of balance? Dr. Huda Zogby has devoted her career to unraveling these puzzles. 
She shares the Kavli Prize with Jean-Louis Mandel, Harry Orr, and Christopher Walsh for discovering the genetic pathways behind serious brain disorders. Scientific American Custom Media, in partnership with the Kavli Prize, spoke with Huda to learn more about her research. The Kavli Prize is a prestigious honor on its own, but the award holds a special place in Dr. Huda Zogby's heart. Because it recognizes work that I have so cherished. It is work with my longtime collaborator, Harry Orr, and I so cherish the work as well as our relationship over the years. So to me, this was the sweetest way to recognize that work. Huda and Professor Harry Orr both received the Kavli Prize this year for research that has been intertwined for decades. Our collaboration has outlasted most American marriages. It all started when Huda was at the very beginning of her career. She was trying to unravel the genetic cause of a disorder that affected the balance and speech of a large family in Texas. At around 40 years old, affected family members will start feeling a little bit off balance if they're making a quick move. Slowly, their speech becomes slurred, and that gets worse and worse with time. Eventually, the family members lose their ability to walk and talk clearly. They typically die around 20 years later of causes related to breathing or swallowing problems. The disorder is known as spinocelebellar ataxia type 1, or SCA1. It's a family with 200 members, and I started immediately driving every few days to Montgomery and collecting samples. With the samples Huda gathered and the help of her colleagues, she discovered that the gene responsible for SEA1 was located on chromosome 6. But she still had a long way to go. Imagine you mapped it to the state of Texas, right? And now you're going to find where the house is. So we had to really get the map closer and closer and narrow in to get close to it. Time passed, and she finally started getting closer to the location of the gene. Let's say she'd located the city. She also discovered that Professor Harry Orr at the University of Minnesota was studying a similar disorder in the same general area of chromosome 6. I read papers by him showing that we are in the same city. And I was like, wow, this guy is impressive. He's done all this work. They eventually met and started sharing information. But over time, it became clear that they were looking at genes in different locations. By then, Harry had an inkling that his gene is towards one side, let's say the at most northern side of the city. And I had data to suggest it's at the southern side of the city. So we're far apart. Huda learned a complicated technique to create little addresses or markers on chromosome 6 to better locate her gene. And she thought, Why not share them with Harry? So I called him up and I said, look, I made those hybrids. If you want to use them, please go ahead and take them. And he was like, great. So we're communicating. We're having really beautiful, cordial relationship. Huda went on with her research, but she had this nagging thought in the back of her brain. I think there's something fishy here. How could it be that she and Harry were studying two different diseases if both had similar symptoms with a genetic cause in the same general region of chromosome 6. I kept pushing and pushing. Eventually, who would have found a mistake in the data from the family she was studying? Everyone had assumed a group of daughters inherited SCA1 from their mother. But it turns out it was actually the father who passed the disorder to his girls. Huda quickly worked with a technician to rerun some of her experiments. Cataloging everything for all the branch of this family to construct what came from dad, what came from mom. And when we did that, it fell on top of Harry's gene. She immediately called Harry. I said, Harry, I used this marker. It puts it right on top of your gene. We're working on the same disease. Huda was relieved, but Harry was worried. Because back then, cloning a disease gene was a big deal. Everybody wanted the glory to themselves. Harry asked if Huda wanted him to return the resources she shared with him. I said, no, 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 no. You keep them. We work together. Now we really collaborate. Now we're working on the same thing. 15 seconds of silence. And he said, let's do it. 
when Huda and Harry combined their data, they were able to narrow the location of their gene down to about 1 million base pairs. They slowly examined each gene, one at a time. But then Huda heard a scientific talk about a disorder that was marked by repeating letters of DNA. I said, Harry, we're not going to walk gene by gene. I just heard this awesome talk from Tom Kasky, and it's it. These three bases of DNA that repeat. Let's just ignore everything else and focus on finding repeats. So she and Harry divided their genes up, including a little bit of overlap, and started hunting. A few weeks later, on the same day... April 8, 1993, he sent me a fax. He discovered the mutation in his family, and I sent him a fax. I discovered the mutation in my family. Huda and Harry have been working together ever since. Before Huda submits a grant proposal, she always lets Harry know. Harry, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And he goes, perfect. I'm not doing any of that. I will write a letter to assure the reviewers and to tell them how I will help you. And I do the same for him. Between them, they've discovered that the gene responsible for SEA1 produces a protein called a taxin-1 that causes clumps in the brain and leads to that loss of balance. They've also developed a new type of treatment that improves SEA1 symptoms in mice. It's a rare collaboration in a world that's highly competitive. What made them do it? I don't think either of us really thought about who's going to get credit. Honestly, we just wanted to solve this problem. And I think that was the driver. Also, they were young. I would say most of my good decisions were due to naivety. You know, trust your heart and don't overthink it. Really. Huda says this collaboration has deepened their knowledge, not just of SEA1, but other neurological disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. And my long-term vision is prevention. And I'm excited about venturing in that area and finding things that we can maybe take a small pill for that's safe for people who had a family history of disease or had a risk genotype. Her work with Harry is already being used in clinical trials for treating SCA1 and other disorders. Her advice for scientists that want to follow in her path? Be patient. Everybody looks at me and gets excited because of the big discovery. I want to remind everybody, there were years for each of these discoveries, and that's okay. Huda says, in science, it might take a long time for success to come. But when it does, it's so satisfying especially when it's shared with a good friend. Dr. Huda Zogby is a professor at Baylor College of Medicine, the director of the Jan and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute at Texas Children's Hospital, and an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. This year, she shared the Kavli Prize in Neuroscience with Harry Orr, Jean-Louis Mandel, and Christopher Walsh. The Kavli Prize honors scientists for breakthroughs in astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience, transforming our understanding of the big, the small, and the complex. The Kavli Prize is a partnership among the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research, and the U.S.-based Kavli Foundation. This work was produced by Scientific American Custom Media and made possible through the support of the Kavli Prize. I was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean when it happened. There was a sudden jolt and our submarine crashed on the seafloor. We were in total darkness. That's Dr. Dejana Figueroa, a marine biologist and STEM teacher, talking about a deep sea dive she'll never forget. It's funny, when I was a kid, I was afraid of the ocean. And there I was, two miles below the surface. But as a scientist, you prepare for that. Using our training and a little creativity, we fixed the sub and finished our experiments. The dive was just too important. Every dive gives us glimpses at things few people ever get to see. Blowing creatures, fiery undersea volcanoes. When we got back to the surface, I kissed the ground and called my mom, of course. But you know what? I wouldn't trade that dive for anything. Dr. Figueroa uses her passion for STEM to discover new things and make the world a better place. She can STEM, so can you. Check out She Can STEM for more stories and inspiration. A message from the Ad Council. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Good eating habits developed in childhood can last a lifetime. 
but getting children to eat their fruits and vegetables is a common problem. Eating them adds important nutrients, helps control weight, and reduces the risks for many serious illnesses. Children in the U.S. are eating more fruit. However, 60% of children get fewer fruits than recommended, and 93% don't get enough vegetables. Child care, schools, and school districts can help change this by meeting or exceeding federal nutrition standards for meals and snacks, including fruits and vegetables wherever food is offered, and helping children learn about and taste fruits and vegetables. At home, parents can eat a variety of fruits and vegetables with their children and provide them as snacks, even if it takes many tries. Also, parents can include their children when shopping for, growing, and preparing fruits and vegetables. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. Local heroes faced threats. Listen up. This matters. I'm Lewis Black, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. Local heroes faced threats was a recent headline for the Associated Press story about the, quote, chilling, tearful testimony from local election officials to the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the Capitol and the efforts to prevent Joe Biden from being sworn in as president. Those local officials in key battleground states testified about being leaned on to reject ballots and to submit alternate electors who would vote contrary to the results of the elections in their states. As one official put it, there were a lot of threats wishing death upon me. Congressman Benny Thompson, the chair of the January 6th committee, praised those local officials who stood for accuracy and honesty in the counting of ballots, characterizing them as the backbone of democracy. Chairman Thompson succinctly summarized the threat this way. A handful of election officials in key states stood between Donald Trump and the upending of democracy. Although the January 6th committee has not yet written its report, one conclusion already is clear. The United States has taken great pride in the strength of our democracy. And yet it turns out that our democracy actually is fragile. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the American Civil Liberties Union because freedom can't defend itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1880. Chicago labor leader Agnes Nestor was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Her father had been a machinist and a member of the Knights of Labor. Like many other families of the era, the Nestor family moved to Chicago during the Depression that swept the country in the mid-1890s. Agnes went to work at a glove-making factory. At the factory, the women were charged for the power it took to run the sewing machines. They also had to pay for the needles they used. Agnes helped to lead a successful strike against these practices. The strike was supported by the men's union at the plant. Agnes recalled the aims of the strike, saying, No more machine rent, no paying for needles, free machine oil, union shop, raises for the cutters who were paid the lowest wages. Agnes went on to describe the day-to-day organization of the strike, saying, We joined the picket line again and held meetings every day and evening in the hall the cutters had rented. How important we felt. Speakers sent to our evening meetings were furnished by the Chicago Federation of Labor Organization Committee. After the strike had lasted more than a week, management sent letters to the employees, offering to meet almost all of their demands. However, they refused to recognize the union. The women turned down the proposal. And after 10 days, the women won their demands, including the right for union representation. In 1902, Agnes led the women glove makers on a campaign to form their own union. She also served as the president of the Chicago Women Trade Union League for more than 40 years. Agnes Nestor spent her life fighting for women's right to vote, the eight-hour day, and child labor protection. 
Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 52 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of about 90. Our snoozing sous chef is doing such a fine job snoozing. Anyway, uh, we will be getting up to around 90 or a tad above, and that will be about the same as what we had yesterday. It did get quite warm indeed. Sunny throughout the day, winds out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Clear skies overnight with lows in the low 60s, winds out of the north at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And mainly sunny tomorrow with highs around 102 And then Sunday, we're expecting 105 or warmer. Winds will be light and variable. Confirmed cases of coronavirus, of course, were updated uh, Wednesday, Thursday. And we will get another update maybe tonight, maybe next week. We will see. But they now stand at confirmed cases 461,025. Our deceased had gone up, and we now stand at 549. And I should also add Jackson County here in the southern part of Oregon is on a recommended mask indoors and outdoors. The only county in Oregon recommended to do so. Grass pollen is rated very high here in Rogue River itself. The air quality uh, for the uh, Rogue River Valley region is good at 20 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is very high at level 9. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.05 inches. Visibility is at 9 miles And relative humidity is actually falling and is down to 60%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 70 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 74 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 88 and fair. Kiev is 81 and fair. Kabul is 74 and clear. Hong Kong is 84 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 80 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 54 and clear. San Francisco, California is 56 and partly cloudy with a fog advisory on the bay and offshore. And New York, New York is 75 degrees Fahrenheit and partly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Ellen Francis of the Washington Post brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast, cookbook and speakeasy. 
At 16 weeks pregnant, Andrea Prudente traveled with her partner to the European island nation of Malta for a baby moon holiday. However, instead of enjoying a relaxing trip to celebrate her pregnancy, the American woman started bleeding heavily and and was admitted to the hospital, getting trapped in what she called a nightmare after doctors told her the fetus would not survive. Hospital authorities in Malta the only country in the European Union that bars abortion under any circumstances, would not allow them to terminate the pregnancy. Rights activists in Malta say the legislation threatens reproductive health and have sought to challenge it in court. The couple from Washington State near Seattle said Prudente's water broke and there was no more anemiotic fluid, raising the risk of an infection and the possible threat to her life. They feared they were stuck as they requested a medical transfer to another country to end the pregnancy, but initially had difficulty being certified as fit to travel by doctors. After days of panic and appeals for help, Prudente secured an emergency airlift yesterday, Thursday, via their travel insurance to undergo the procedure in Mallorca, Spain. We certainly did not come for an abortion, but here we are talking about saving a woman's life, her partner, Jay Weedler, Weedryer, told the Times of Malta earlier. Doctors for Choice, which advocates for reproductive rights in Malta, and services including abortion said that despite the woman's ruptured membranes and detaching placenta, an abortion was denied because there is still a fetal heartbeat. 16 weeks. Medics had told Prudente they can only intervene if she is imminently dying, the group said this week, even though she faced the strain of carrying a fetus that would not survive and the risk of infection, such as sepsis or hemorrhaging. Guidelines typically recommend offering termination to avoid infection or death in critical cases where the fetus is not yet viable before 24 weeks. Now, remember, she was at 16. While the U.S. couple may have secured an evacuation through their travel insurance, the nonprofit said it heard from Maltese women in similar situations who were scared to speak out and had few options. The country's laws mean women who have an abortion and doctors who help can face jail time. Sounds quite familiar now, doesn't it? Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers Rod McGurk of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said he will meet President Emmanuel Macron in France next week to reset a bilateral relationship that was damaged when the previous Australian government canceled a submarine contract. Albanese said Macron had invited him to visit France while he was in Europe to attend a NATO meeting in Spain. France responded uh, with fury when former Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced in September that Australia was canceling a contract for a French state-owned company to build a fleet of 12 conventional diesel electric submarines that were set at $62 billion U.S. Instead, Australia had struck a deal with the United States and Britain 
to provide submarines powered by U.S. nuke technology. France temporarily withdrew its ambassadors from the U.S. and Australia. Macron accused Morrison of lying to him over the French contract that was awarded in 2016. Morrison denied the accusation. Yes, he did. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and the week. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here on Monday for River City Hash Mondays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night and all weekend for all the breaking news as it breaks. And boy, is it breaking. And we will meet up here on Monday right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer D'un manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère D'un manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Ton mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair Ton bras les yeux ouverts Ton mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver